Guys, this is really excited about our 21 days of prayer. Um, really, we do this twice a year, and it's really, um, as Maggie said in, in the video, it's a real cornerstone of our church because we believe that uh, this house shall be called the house of prayer. And we believe that God hears our prayers. Not only does he hear them, that he also answers them. Uh, do you believe that? Okay, good. All right. So um, w when you came in, you were handed this um, card right here. It has a list of all of the, the different things that we're going to be praying for as a body together every day for 21 days. And we're believing God to give us a real breakthrough. But one thing I'm really excited about, and this just this has great results every year, is these little prayer cards. When you came in, you were handed one of these prayer cards. It's blank, but this is for you to write on there your prayer request. What are you going through? What do you need? What are you believing God for? Um, it could be from relationships to finances to um, anything else, health, whatever it may be. Maybe you, you, you're passionate about our city or, or the nation or the world. Whatever it is that is on your heart, I'm just going to ask you, write this on here. And we're going to be praying for these on Wednesday night. And I'm going to encourage you, come on out. Um, no need to put any personal information on here, but you can write, I'm just believing that God does this or I'm asking God to do this. God knows who you are. And on Wednesday, we're going to gather. There's going to be two tables up here with these prayer requests on there. We're going to start with some worship, and then we're going to move into us praying over all of these cards. And we'll come up and grab some and walk around and pray for them and then come get another one. It's very, very powerful. And we've heard testimonies of God answering prayers. Every time we do 21 days of prayer. So you have these and you can fill these out. Even while I'm preaching, you can fill these out. I give you permission to do that so that at the end of service, you can drop them in the white buckets when you leave here today. So really excited about that because I believe God is doing a new thing. And God wants to do new things in your life. He wants to meet you where you are. He wants to heal you. He wants to strengthen you. He wants to give you peace in the middle of a storm. Or he wants to remove the storm. Depends on whatever God is doing in your life. I know this, that God is always birthing new things in our lives for his purposes and for his glory. And one of the, the, uh, the scriptures today, as I was preparing for this message, we're in this series called Fresh Start. Because I believe God is giving many of of us fresh starts in areas of our lives becomes it comes from Isaiah 43 and this is a, a prophecy spoken over the children of Israel but I believe it's a it's a word to us in your life and maybe maybe you need to hold on to this today and this is the reality of this that God's saying I'm about to do something new amen I'm gonna read that again I'm about to do something new for your life I've already begun do you not see it I will make a pathway through the wilderness. In other words, where you think there is no way, our God will make a way. And I will create rivers and dry wastelands. Where you think something has dried up and died, God can and will breathe new life into it. And so this is what I'm believing through this series, that God's doing something new. Today's message is incredibly, incredibly important to all of us because what we're dealing with today is what happens before we ever do anything, before we ever feel emotions, before we ever make a decision, before a word ever comes out of our mouths. The greatest influence on your life, on the actions of our life, our relationships, our feelings, our journey with God and journey with others, is this is what it is. The greatest influence on all of that is what happens in our minds, what happens between our two ears. What happens in the mind, I want you to hear me today, will find its way into your life. Whatever happens in your mind will find its way into your life. And I believe God wants our minds to be healthy and to have a fresh start. And this is what I believe God wants for us this year and what God wants for you today. So I've been praying over you. I've been believing that this message sets some of you free. That God brings truth in, the, in a lie that you believed in your mind and you can leave here delivered and set free and with, a, with tools in your hand to be able to continue to move forward and have a healthy thought life. Because your thought life really, really matters. So many times in, in the Christian world we, we, we just focus on actions and behavior, actions and behavior. But actually we don't, do, we don't act on anything, we don't behave in any way without first having a thought but here's the reality, all of us are constantly being assaulted in our minds, constantly, every day, all around us, we are being assaulted in our minds. 
Now, Scripture is clear that we are in the world, but we're not of the world. What in the world means is that we are going to rub shoulders with values and thoughts and beliefs that are contrary to what God's values and thoughts and beliefs are. But what happens is, is when you're around the world, which all of us are in, you can pick up unhealthy patterns of thinking. You can pick up unhealthy ways of processing how we view relationships, how we view marriage, how we view all these different types of things. You can pick them up and you can begin to believe a lie that it, and, it, and it manifests itself in your life because we are surrounded by it all the time. But the Word of God, I promise you, has a plan to keep our minds thinking straight and being healthy. And so this is about having a healthy mind, mental health today, but we're focusing on our thoughts. Our minds are the very foundation for us as a believer, and it's important for us to manage our thoughts, manage our minds, because again, it affects every area of our lives. So why does our thought life matter? Why does it really matter? Isn't it, Jason, just what we do that really matters? No, no, it really matters And I just want to give you three things. One, our thought life matters because it is the key to our peace. So this is why we're going to to lean into this and allow God to do something and speak to us today because our thought life is the key to our peace. Romans 8, 6 says this, that the mind is governed by the, a mind that's governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Peace. And I would say every one of us could use a, a couple, some of this. We could use some fresh life in our minds and we could use some fresh peace in our minds. Another reason why our thought life matters is because our battle against sin begins actually in our minds. It begins in our minds. It's, it's a thought. And then we would behave or act on it. Romans 7 says this. And this is, this is Paul writing. He says, for in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. So the reality is this, is that there is a battle going on, and that battle is in our mind. It's where we wage the war against sin. Another reason why I thought life matters is this, because our life is controlled by what goes on in our minds. So many people think, well, it doesn't matter. I can think whatever I want, and it doesn't really matter because it's in here. Nobody sees it. No, listen, listen. It has made its way. If you are entertaining, it will make its way into your life and begin to come up and show up somewhere at some time. So our life is controlled by what goes on in our minds. And the Bible says that the, that, that the power of your mind, the power of your thoughts, has tremendous ability to shape your life for good and for bad, both ways. If you were growing up and someone said to you, you're worthless, or they said you're no good, or they said you don't matter, or they said you're ugly, or, or you believe the lie that you're, you're, you're too thin, or you're too fat, or you're stupid, if you accept that in your mind, whether it was right or wrong, it has shaped your life and has affected you even to where you are today. Our thoughts have such an effect on how we live our lives, and the world and others around us are constantly trying to shape the way you think. They're trying to conform our minds into what they want, or conform our minds into their value system, or conform our minds to process in a way that they want us to process. So how do we become healthy in our thoughts and our minds? Because it really does matter. God has spoken to us about our minds. And he's given us tools to be able to do that. But he gives, Paul gives an instructions out of Romans chapter 12. Knowing that our minds are constantly being, being, being thumped on or trying to be influenced. This is what Paul says. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your what? Then you will, then, then, after your mind is renewed, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good and pleasing and perfect will. This is 
How do you define, how do you figure out what God's will is? How, how do you live in his good and pleasing, perfect will? You have a renewed mind. And as your mind is renewed, you're able to discern and hear the voice of God on situations and with conjunction with the partnership with the word of God, which I'm going to talk about today. So how do we have healthy thoughts? How do we have a healthy thought life? Number one, in order to have a healthy thought life, you must nurture your mind with truth. You must nurture your mind with truth. You must feed your mind truth. We have a friend who's really passionate about physical health. And so she says this all the time. She says this. She goes, your body is not a garbage can, so stop treating it like one. Same way with our minds. Your mind is not a garbage can. It's time that we stop treating it like one. We all know that this, that what we take in eventually will become our behavior and become our attitudes. Or another way of saying it is garbage in, garbage out. Garbage in, garbage out. What you allow your minds, what you allow into your mind begins to shape you. Shape what you believe. And what you believe actually will be what you will become. But we know that this, we can't, we can't focus our lives just on what we eat physically. It must be about what we eat spiritually. What we take into our minds is very important. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 4. He says this, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So in other words, we cannot sustain life unless we are feeding our minds with truth. Scripture says that the Bible it has been God-breathed. He breathed it. We have it to read and for it to help us and help transform us. From his mouth, that the Bible is food for our souls. It rewire, rewires our minds to think like God. To see things the way that God would see things. And that's why it's important to have a daily, systematic reading of the Word of God. And when you do that, no matter if it's a little bit or it's a lot, when you do that, the Word cleanses your mind. It helps you think clearer about situations. And you cannot, listen to me please, you cannot cleanse your own mind. Only God can. You can't do it. You can, you can work on some goals and some of your behaviors, but only God through his son Jesus Christ can transform your mind. But as we read the word of God, it is God breathed and it's supernatural and it cleanses us, it washes our mind. And you can, you can allow your minds to slowly change. What you allow into your minds will slowly change you, either, either be for the good or again it can be for the bad. For me this is very important. In many areas, but because of, for me, how, how I came into ministry was through the avenue of, of worship leading. And music has always been a very powerful thing in my life. And so what I realized at a young age is that when I allowed myself to listen to some types of music, it affected my mood. It affected my behavior. It affected my thought life. And so that's why it's very passion. I'm very passionate about our music. And, and for you parents, I just want to encourage you, please, 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 monitor what your children are listening to. It's worth it. If you want to know why their attitude stinks, find out what they're listening to. And I guarantee you there will be some correlation to that. Because what you allow in your mind to entertain you, to move you, to inspire you, will end up leading you. It will end up leading you. And so that's why what we allow, to, what we watch with our eyes, what we listen to with our ears affects our minds because everything in our life begins with a thought and then behavior. With this, back to this area about music. When you think of the story of Saul and David, and when I read this, it, uh, this, is, this is one of the things that the Lord has really just solidified in my own heart. Saul had a demonic spirit that would torment him. And so David, who was anointed by God, would begin to play his harp. He would begin to play music. And when he played it, because he was anointed by God, God took that music and it caused peace to fall on Saul. It, it caused the evil spirit to leave Saul. 
So if, if the spirit, if someone anointed by God's spirit can play music and they can affect someone's, um, can give peace to someone and re remove tormenting spirits from them, if you were to reverse that, someone anointed by the enemy can play music and if we open our minds to it and receive it, it can bring us fear, it can bring us attitudes, it can begin to shape our minds and our feelings and our behaviors. So that's why it's very important. What we allow into our minds has a deep effect on us. That's why we are to nurture our minds with the truth from the Word of God because it affects our lives. The Word of God, when we read it, it lights our pathway. It sustains us. It's our source of life. We cling to it like it's the most precious thing that we have. It's God's breath on a page for us to read. God exhaled and gave us the word of God. We cling to it. It's the most valuable thing we have on this earth. It's not the result of a printing press. It's a result of God exhaling and giving us a gift to cleanse our minds. His breath did not die when it reached the pages. It's still alive. And it's very important. Hebrews chapter 4 talks about the importance of the Word of God and the power of it. It says this, for the Word of God is alive and active. In other words, it's not dead and old and boring. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It cuts deep. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So the word of God, it judges thoughts. It judges the attitudes. It gives us a mirror for us to know. And then as we read it, it begins to shape and, and transform us. The word of God draws lines in the sand that we can't draw ourselves because of our sin. But the word of God draws the lines. And this is what we need to know as our minds are constantly being assaulted, trying to be shaped by the world around us. The Word of God holds the line. The Word of God deals with the issues of sexuality, divorce, what we do with our money, the issues of homosexuality, justice, abortion, taxes, government, leadership, marriage, Salvation, parenting, discipline, God's love, God's forgiveness. The issues of every single major thing in our society, in our lives, can be clarified by the word of God. And in our minds, as we read it, it is washed with the words and we grow and become healthier as believers. This is important. Charles, Char Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, visit many books, but live in the Bible. Why? Because I'm telling you guys, we are living in a world that has, that there is more pressure on the way that we think than ever before in history. We're, be, we're being hit up all the time with, the, with social media, with the, with the internet, with the news, with advertisement, with whatever all that is. That should, that's increasing. I'm not saying all that's bad. I'm just saying it is being used to shape our, the way that we think. And that's why we need to have a, a constant diet of the Word of God in our lives. The second way to have a healthy mind and healthy thoughts is number two, be relentless about removing destructive thoughts from our minds. Be relentless. Don't have it. Don't entertain it. Because our minds, every one of us, needs to be liberated. Our mind needs to be set free. Our mind needs to be delivered. Because what happens is, is we can become a prisoner of our own thoughts. And we can be prisoners of things that people have told you that simply weren't true. We just believed it. If you believe it, it's affected your life. So we've got to free ourselves from destructive thoughts. And it's not easy. It's not easy at all. Because there, we have enemies against our minds. We have enemies who are trying to, to pull us down. There are things that are that they're trying to keep us from, from fulfilling our good intentions, fulfilling what God's laid on our own hearts. But we have an enemy of our mind. Actually, we have three of them, which I'm going to talk to you in just a minute. That's battling our brain to keep us from following what we know to be true. And that's why we combat that with nurturing our minds with truths. But these enemies, I'm telling you, they're not going to give up ground 
easily because we've become so comfortable with them. We've, we've gotten our cues from how we think from these enemies, and we think the right cues, but they're actually not. So I'm gonna, let me give you the enemies of our minds. The enemy of our minds, your mind, is number one, the enemy of our mind is Satan. Satan wants to control your mind. He can't, but he wants to. So he sends ideas. He sends thoughts. But let me just be real clear. Satan cannot force you to do anything if you're a Christian. He, can't, he, has, he, he doesn't. He doesn't have authority over you. You have the Holy Spirit in you. Satan cannot force you to do anything. Because you need to hear this. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. But, but, he can make suggestions. And those suggestions are very powerful. He's constantly planting negative thoughts in your mind. He'll use people. He'll use television. He'll use whatever it may be. He'll use it to throw a curveball and it hits your mind. And you'll think, oh my gosh, where in the world did that thought come from? My Lord, I, where, where did that come from? That's Satan. He's putting thoughts in your mind. One of the most important things, and I want you to hear me today, about your thought life. This is the most liberating thought you'll, you'll ever get. You ready? You don't have to believe everything you think. <laughs> Write that down on your fridge. I don't have to believe everything I think. Because what happens, we think, well, I thought it, therefore it must be true, unless it's not. Listen, we think a lot of stuff that isn't true. And this is what Satan does. He, he puts a thought in your mind, and you say, well, I just had that thought. It must be true. I mean, b- bizarre, bizarre things. People will have a thought about all types of stuff. If, if you believe a, a thought or a lie from Satan about someone, you will start acting like that lie is true and it will sabotage relationships because you believe the lie about the individual that wasn't even true. And you begin acting like it's true, behaving like it's true, and what happens is it, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that you believed a lie and therefore the lie came true because you acted like it was true. I mean, people leave churches, they leave small groups, They lead communities because they had a thought about someone or something. And they, since they thought it, it must be true. And they, they give up. I've seen it happen in time and time. I've had the privilege of being part of Christian communities. My my whole, my whole, for 20 years, I've worked in the, served in the church. People will give up relationships of 20, 25 years because they had a thought about something or someone that was a total lie, but they believed it was true, and then they left that community. And Satan's like, that's exactly what I wanted to do. Satan will try to tell you that you're stupid. He'll try to tell you, and if you believe it, you will begin to act it out. If, you, you know, the thought is you're not intelligent, you're a failure. So what happens when opportunity comes in front of you, you don't take the opportunity because you're believing the lie and you think I can't do that because I'm this or because I'm that. This is very, very powerful, these, these thoughts in, in our minds. Satan will lie to you. And this is the battle we're all in. And, you know, you have to raise your hand. Anyone ever woken up in the middle of the night with a thought that was so strong you thought that has to be God? But with it came fear and anxiety? I, I'll just tell you right now, this happened about eight years ago to me. It's never happened since. Happen, it happened this one time. And we, Cheryl and I were at a transition on our ministry, and, and we, were, we were traveling a lot, and I was, I was tired, and, and in the middle of the night... I woke up and I heard a voice. It was so loud, I, it was almost audible to this day. I don't know if it was or not, but this is what the voice says Cheryl is going to leave you and divorce you. And I was like, oh, oh my gosh. And I thought, that must be God. 
God's just warning me because, because I had the thought, and it's so strong it must be true. And then I thought, wait a minute, like what's going on? What do you mean? Like our marriage is great. We're enjoying life together, enjoying ministry together. But all of a sudden this, this lie comes out of nowhere, and it hits my mind. And I'm filled with fear, and I'm filled, and I'm like, and I'm like hey, wake up. Hey, are you leaving me? No, I didn't say I wanted to do it because lies feel so real. Now, let me ask you this. What if I would have believed that and I would have started acting like that's true? I would have started treating her differently. I would have started just being distant from her, not trusting her and everything. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I would have begun acting like that was true, which would have led to what the lie originally was. She probably would have been like, man, you're such a knucklehead. I can't stand you. Until maybe God would have brought someone in our lives to help us. But at that moment, I realized this is a lie. Satan, this is of you. And even lies will come like this. You know what? And it, it will feel so clear. And this is what the lie will say. You deserve better. God wants you to be happy. Therefore, you need to divorce your spouse. And it feels so true. Okay. That must be God. But it's not. That's why you have, to, you have to guard your mind from the thoughts of the enemy. Because they, he is out to sabotage your life. He's, he's out to get you off track. So I, 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 I did wake Cheryl up. I said, hey, babe, listen, I'm under spiritual attack. I need you to pray. And in those moments, you just need somebody to pray for me. And she rolled over, eyes closed, put her hand on my head. Lord, just help Jason and help him. No, I'm done. <laughs> but it helped. But it took me three days to shake that. I kept fighting against it. I kept, man, Cheryl, you got to pray. Come on, let's pray. pray. It, was, it was a demonic attack. It was a thought that pierced my heart. It was vulnerable. I was tired in the season of ministry. And the, it pierced my heart. And this is the power of these lies. And when we believe a lie, it changes our identity. It changes what, how we behave, how we act. God, God's, try, God's trying to change our identity into who he sees us. He's always listening, you're my son, you're my daughter, I've called you, you're, you're with me. He's, he's changed your name in Christ, but many of us are still living under the definition of our old name. We're living under the definition of the lie, whatever was spoken. And God's wanting us to start living under his definition of what he calls us to be and who he calls us to function and to live under. Lies are so powerful because they can shape your behavior. They can keep you from living in the identity God sees you. And God loves to change names. He loves to change names. He loves to take um, maybe this name or this label or this title that's been spoken over you. He likes to take those and then change them and give you another name, another title. He, he loves to do it. You have, uh, you have Peter. We all know Peter. But Peter wasn't always his name. His name was Cephas. So actually what, what happens, he changed from Cephas. And then when God, when Jesus changed his name to Peter, he became the apostle Peter. He became a champion of the gospel. God changed his name. He changed him. He changed his identity. The apostle Paul wasn't always Paul. His name was Saul. Until Jesus met him on a road and he says, you're going to be called Paul now. And therefore, from that moment on, everything of his old identity had gone away and Paul started a new identity. He became a champion for the church. Jacob, who was, who was the name meant deceiver, wrestled with an angel of the Lord. And when he was done wrestling, the Lord says, now your name is Israel. And that's where the whole line of Israel, that's what the whole pathway of God's provision through the, through the nation of Israel has come through, through, used to be Jacob, now he's changed it to Israel. God loves to change names because he realizes, I'm going to change your name so you start to think differently about yourself. I'm going to change your name so, so you can start, so don't believe that lie anymore. Believe what I'm calling you. I'm doing something new. Don't you perceive it? There's a proverb out of uh, Proverbs 23. It says this, for as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. God loves to change your name. But the Satan is one of our enemies. The second enemy is, the, is our flesh. 
It's just the flesh. We, it's, we wrestle with this old nature. It's still, still there. We wrestle with it. Though it's, we are redeemed, we wrestle with this nature. Romans 7, for again it says this, For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body, from this flesh that is subject to death. We have shadows of our old nature, our fallen nature. It's redeemed, but some of our desires of our flesh is fighting against us. This is why Paul says this, I crucify my what? My flesh. How often? Daily I crucify my flesh. Another enemy of our minds is the culture we live in. What is culture promoting? Have you ever thought that? What is our culture promoting? What, what, what are they promoting? Well, the Bible says in 1 John 4, says the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. So the lust, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is all from the world. It's from our culture. The world's not helping anyone become more disciplined. The world's not helping anyone become more, more, more godly, more self-controlled, to have more restraint. The world's teaching us that if you feel it, you should do it. If you think it, it must be true. So act on it. Just be, you're just like an animal. You just, just, whatever I feel, I just do it. The world has a value system. It's promoting it by everything that we see. The world around us is not encouraging us to pursue and have healthy thought lives. It's not. So if these are our enemies, how do we fight them? 2 Corinthians Chapter 10, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they are divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. This is how we do it. So how do we have healthy minds and healthy thoughts? We set our minds on things that matter the most. Set our minds on things that matter the most. Colossians 3 says this, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. So let's find out what, 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 matters, what matters most then. What do we set our minds on? Number one, you set your minds on Jesus. You fix your eyes on Jesus. You remind yourself daily of what Jesus has done for you. He's, he's redeemed you. He, he, he died on the cross in your place. That the promises of God, yes and amen, are found in Christ. That we are to set our minds on him. Hebrews 12 says this. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Fix our eyes, dwell on Jesus. Remember what he's done. Live in that identity. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. You may have things in your life you're dealing with, but it's not your identity. You might have struggles, but that struggle isn't your identity. You might, you might have addiction, but that addiction is not, you are not an addict. You are a son or a daughter of God. You might have a label on you, think that's just the way it is. No, it's not. Does Jesus say that's the way it is? Whatever Jesus says is the identity you're to live under. Stop listening to what everyone and everything else tries to tell you you are. Start listening to the pure voice of the Father that declares who you are. That's where you live. Secondly, how do we combat this? Is you set your minds to serve others. This actually will help free your mind. Philippians 2, 3 and 4 says this. In humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. This is countercultural, that you would actually consider someone else before you would consider yourself. Listen, we live in what's, what's in it for me. I, what about number one? I want it my way. It's the Burger King Christianity. You know, have it your way. Whatever. 
But as we begin to serve one another, this, this, this is a very powerful thing on what matters most. Focus your heart and mind on what matters most. Serve others. Hebrews 10, 24, let us think of ways to motivate one another in acts of love and good works. Serve one another. The best place to do this, my friends, is in your small group. Serve one another. Find out with, with what you guys need. Find out what someone else needs. Find out how you can pray for them. Serve one another. If something's going on in someone's life, figure out how do I serve them. How, how, do, I, how do I come alongside them and strengthen them? Listen, let each other see the good deeds and the love. Yet This is why we have small groups. This is why we do this. Because it helps us focus on what matters most. What matters most is our, our ability and our, our desire to serve one another. Number three, set your minds on heaven. This is what you set your minds on. Focus on heaven. It will make a, the big diff, biggest difference in your mental state if you realize I'm, uh, this world is actually not my home. I'm not living here forever. This is, I, this is this little blip on the radar of eternity. And I'm living for heaven. The problem is for all of us today, we have short-term thinking. We think we're about right now, right now, what's happening right now. And it can keep us from actually having this sense of mental health and a good thought life. Because you know what, yeah, I'm doing this, but I'm not living for, I'm not living for this earth. I'm living for eternity. Yes, I, I, I could use all my finances on me or I could help give them to the kingdom to help reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because I'm living for eternity. I can serve someone or I can give and, or I can, I can be aware of what's going on. Why? Because, no, 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 this world is not my home. I'm living for eternity. This world's not about me. This, my life is not about me. It's about me serving others, fixing my eyes on Jesus and living in a way that promotes heaven. That always says, no, no, I'm living for heaven. I'm serving for heaven. That's why I do And this helps us. This is what matters most. Colossians 3.2 says this. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Now, obviously, we live on earth. But what this, this is talking about some of the, the values. This is why we, why we exist on this. Or think about heaven, not about the earthly things. Because if we think about earthly things too much, you get distracted. You end up reading Fox News more than you do your Bible. You end up focusing on things, looking for information about the world. when we could be living for something so much greater. Heaven. And when we set our minds on this, our perspectives begin to change. We nurture our minds with truth. We allow the word of God to wash us. We allow God to, to transform us. We begin to say, you know what, God, I, I, I'm not, I don't want to believe the lies anymore. God, I want to nurture my mind with truth. I want, to be, I want to be relentless at removing these destructive thoughts. So I'm not, going to let them, I'm not going to let them dwell. I think it was Martin Luther that said this. You know, negative thoughts are like, um, they're like birds that are always flying over your head. He said they're always going to be there, but you don't have to let them make a nest on top of your head. And God wants to clear our minds. God wants this year to be a year that you process and much more clarity. You're not living in suspicion of someone else and fear. There's some people who, who things that happen in, in your life, you, 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 you are, you've drifted to a control freak because that's the only way that you can actually feel secure is if, if you control everything. Why? Because you've believed a lie that you can actually control everything. God wants to set us free. He wants us to live the life that he's called us to live. Some of you feel like because of a sin in your past that it's, it's, it's just, sorry, that's your identity. No, it's not. You. Listen, any gospel, any gospel or any message that says it's the gospel that says your, your future is limited to your past is not the gospel. It's not. God wants to allow us to step out of all the stinking thinking that we have 
and walk in his fresh purposes and fresh thoughts for our lives. So just listen for a second, what God says about you. You might be wrestling even today, and I guarantee you, many of us are. Listen to what God says about you from the Bible. This is why it's important for you to know what truth is. Galatians 3 says that you are a child of God. John 15 says that you are a friend of Jesus. 2 Corinthians says, I'm a whole new person with a whole new life in front of me. 1 Corinthians says, I I am the place where God's spirit dwells. You are the place where God's spirit dwells. Ephesians says that you are God's incredible work of art. 1 John says, I am totally and completely forgiven. Ephesians says, I am created in God's likeness. Ephesians 2 says, I am spiritually alive, no longer dead. Philippians 3 says, I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm an alien on this earth. Philippians 3, or sorry, Acts 1 says, I am God's messenger to the world. Matthew 28 says, I am a disciple maker. God's called me to make a difference with my life. Matthew 5 says that I am the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. Matthew 5 also says that you are the light of the world. And Romans 5 says this, that you are greatly loved. This is what matters. That's the truth. And it's time that we begin to have healthy thoughts about each other, about God, and about the world.